Located in northwestern Wyoming, about 70 miles from the east gate of Yellowstone and about eight miles east of the mountain that gave the camp its name, the Heart Mountain Relocation Center was the northernmost of the 10 World War II Japanese American incarceration camps. It was also the fourth largest, with about 14,000 people living there over three years and a maximum population of 10,767 people, making it the third largest city in Wyoming. In 2011, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation opened the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center, a museum dedicated to exploring the history of this site. The outside of the museum is designed to echo the barracks of the camp, and the interior follows a timeline from the pre-war period to the long-term after effects of the camp. which will live in infamy. The news came that Pearl Harbor had been bombed and it was a shock. My dad always felt, you know, he was really proud of being an American and so naturally he wanted us to feel the same. Even at that age, I knew that we were in trouble. I knew that there would be hatred toward us. I don't recall real animosity, but there was some feeling of tension. Having to sell our farm, and there was uh, some stress I noticed among the family members during that time. They were just yanked out of their livelihood, their homes. And in some ways, I think my folks felt that they were being loyal doing what the government wanted them to do. I don't think that they ever thought that they had any rights. All your possessions that you had either had to store it or give it away. We lost everything. The government told us that we can take that which we can carry. All we had was what we wore and one suit. not knowing what's going to happen, you know, when you're that young, you just do what you're told. All of us were being corralled and shipped somewhere for what reason we don't know, and we had no notion that we were a suspect. We had no notion that the government felt that we were potentially dangerous. All of a sudden, I'm beginning to understand what racism is. has expanded beyond its walls. In 2015, the foundation was able to acquire one of the original Heart Mountain barracks and return it to the site. I'm Dakota Russell, the executive director of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. And today I want to take you on a behind the scenes tour of our original Heart Mountain barrack, which we returned to the site. So come on with me. So this barrack was actually removed from Hard Mountain almost immediately after the war. Like most of the barracks, it was sold by the government, sometimes for as cheap as a dollar a piece. And it was one of two that were actually purchased by the city of Grable. Uh, they moved it all the way over to Grable, um, both of these buildings, and wound up putting them in the city park over there, where they became uh, community centers. Stayed in Grable until the 1960s, and they were actually purchased by Iowa State University. Uh, the university was setting up a geology field school over in Shell, Wyoming, 
at the foothills of the Bighorn Mountains. And so they moved these two barracks in to become cabins for the visiting geologists during the summer. And so for most of the rest of its life, uh, that's what this uh, building became, is, is cabins for geologists. Uh, it wasn't until the 1990s that eventually Iowa State built some new buildings out there. And these barracks kind of fell into disrepair. One of them was lost completely. Uh, this one was slated to be torn down in 2015, but was actually donated instead back to us, provided that we could get it back here. Uh, so, if you follow me, you can see, looking at the floor where this barrack has been stalled into pieces. So each barrack is 120 feet long. That means that it, it, they were usually split into pieces before they were uh, taken away from the camp. Nobody had a trailer that was going to haul anything of that size. So usually they'd either split it into two, if they had a 60-foot trailer that could carry it, or in this case, they split it into three pieces, three 40-foot sections. So when it came time to bring this back to Hard Mountain, we did exactly the same thing. We split it into three sections, once again, and carried those uh, by flatbed over 70 miles uh, of Wyoming roads back here to Hard Mountain, uh, where we uh, placed it on uh, an original foundation, not of a residential barrack, because we don't own any of the residential camp area, but we placed it where one of the military police barracks once was. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the space for you. The room we're in right now is about 60 feet this way by 20 feet this way. Uh, Originally, a barrack like this would have housed six families inside of it. And so we're looking at about half of that. So this would have been divided into three single room units that would have had three families living inside of them. Looking here on the floor, you can see these lines right here that show you this first one, which is 16 feet by 20 feet. The second, which is 24 by 20 feet, the largest size. Generally, you had to have a family of more than five people to get a room of this size. And then finally, right over here, we have a 20 by 20 foot, the medium one. Uh, so generally, families of about four people in this uh, size right here. We are choosing to leave this space open. Uh, we're going to be using it for classroom space for when we have school groups coming through. We use it as event space. Uh, we can uh, hold concerts, programs, other special events in most part of the barrack. And it will also have, eventually, panels on the walls around us that explain the story of the barracks, uh, how the camp was built, um, what living conditions were like inside of the barracks, and eventually what became of all of the camp buildings after the camp closed. Now, I'm gonna take you a little further behind the scenes and give you a preview of what's coming next for the barrack. So as we go into the other half, you'll see I am entering into a little vestibule area right here. Each of the three doors on the front of the barracks opens into one of these vestibules, and then each vestibule would open into two different units. So we'll go into this next space right here. For the other half of the barrack, we'll actually be creating, recreating three different units. Uh, one of each size. So the first one, one that we're in right now is the 20 by 20 size. As you can see, not much has been done so far in here other than just to frame out the walls. Uh, we've begun the process of collecting original stoves from Heart Mountain as well. These are some of the coal burning stoves that were in each one of these units. But eventually, we'll actually fully furnish all of these units. What we are hoping to do is have former incarcerates who actually lived in the size of unit come back to us and sort of recreate their living quarters and narrate that for us so that it'll be a really personal experience coming into here. Let's visit the other two. So eventually you'll see a sliding sort of wall right here to allow us to get through. And we'll enter into the largest size, uh, the 24 by 20 size. So this is where uh, your larger families would have lived. And then finally here on the end, past this last vestibule, This cluttered area right over here 
is going to become one of the 60, 16 by 20 units uh, that generally would have had about two to three people. So you're talking small families, married couples with one child, married couples with no children, or a lot of times uh, folks who didn't have any other family inside of the camp would get assigned two roommates and put into a room of this size. So a lot of older Issei men uh, uh, of the immigrant generation who had never married would be put into these size of rooms right here. But you can really get a sense as you come in here of how cramped this space is. You know, 16 by 20 is not a lot of room. Um, so these spaces are going to be developed in the years to come. I'm hoping by the end of 2021, we will be able to start furnishing at least some of these and be able to give visitors a real sense of what life was like inside of an actual barrack in our mountain. Hi, my name is Callie Stusey. I'm the museum manager for the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center. Welcome to the Heart Mountain Hospital Complex. Anybody who's driven the road between Cody and Powell is probably familiar with the Heart Mountain Chimney. It's a major landmark in the area because it's the tallest man-made structure for miles in any direction. It also, along with the buildings around it, happens to be among the very few original structures of the camp that remain in their original locations. You see, after the Hart Mountain Camp closed, the land was divided into parcels and sold by lottery to homesteaders. Homesteaders were obligated to improve their particular parcels of land, and one way that they could do that was by building a house on the land. They were given the option of purchasing buildings from the camp. So, sometimes for as little as one dollar for half a barracks building, all of the barracks buildings and structures from the camp got scattered all across this local area. However, the hospital complex was never sold off that way. It remained in federal hands, being used originally as warehousing, as office space, as storage space. Eventually, it was given on loan to the local irrigation district, but it still remained federal land. And in fact, it remains federal land to this day. They are currently in discussions with the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation to see if we can purchase this land, but Unfortunately, that requires an act of Congress, so we're working on it. Of the remaining buildings, there are really only three within the hospital complex, but it actually was originally much larger. The area that is fenced off as the hospital complex today is really only about half the size of the original complex. Where I am standing right now is about at the boundary line for where the hospital complex would originally have started. Some of the missing buildings, there were originally 17, so we've lost the dormitories, and that's actually part of the story of the hospital. One of the major issues here was keeping staff on hand. Part of the problem was payroll. You see, there was a rule that anybody working within the camp who was confined there had to be paid less than a private in the army, which meant that a doctor, a highly skilled and trained professional, was being paid $19 a month. So you have these doctors who are getting paid, uh, call it about $320 a year, and they're working alongside nurses who were hired from local communities who were being paid something more along the lines of $1,800 a year. So, as you can imagine, there wasn't a lot of impetus for the doctors to remain at Heart Mountain once they had the option of leaving and working elsewhere. So keeping the staff on hand was very difficult. Some of the other missing buildings are the gynecological area, the OB-GYN area, 
the emergency ward and also some of the specialty wards for the children, for men, for women who had to actually stay at the hospital. This right here is actually the largest of the remaining buildings from the hospital complex. It was originally the hospital mess hall. This is the place where patients and the doctors and nurses would come to have their meals. It also helped to supply specialized dietary requirements for people who had special needs, such as diabetics. The hospital was also responsible for another very important aspect of nutrition. I mentioned the gynecological ward, but one of the problems at the camp for mothers with newborn babies was that if you had trouble producing milk for the baby, there really was no good place to make your own formula for them. So what the hospital did was it mixed up the formula in its kitchens, and then the ambulances would drive around through the camp to bring the formula to the new mothers in the camp. This second building next to the mess hall was originally a warehouse that was meant for storage for the hospital. The hospital actually had two warehouses, only this one is still standing, but on the other side of it you actually can still see the concrete foundation of the other warehouse. Concrete foundations weren't all that widespread throughout the camp, the barracks themselves didn't have them. It's mostly the buildings along the very edge of the terrace here, including the hospital and the administrative complex, that actually had the foundations laid for them. This end of the buildings actually was originally the center of the hospital complex. Originally, the 17 buildings that made up the complex were all connected by a covered hallway that ran along here with buildings on this side and that side. This covered hallway wasn't actually heated, but it was protected from the elements. So there were occasionally jokes about people who would try to get brought into the hospital for treatment so that they could go and have their meals without actually having to go outside. There isn't a lot left of this side of the hospital complex. This is where the various wards for patients were, also the major surgery area. And of course, the boiler room. So now the moment you all, you've all been waiting for, let's go check out the chimney. So here we are, the chimney. Although in fact, the more important part was the building it was attached to, the boiler house for the hospital. The hospital's boiler house had a lot of work to do. The wards in the hospital were all heated by steam. It was basically the only real centrally heated structure in the entire camp. And in addition to providing that heating, which as you can imagine, people who were actually in the hospital needed that extra heat, the boiler house helped to supply the laundry, which again, we still have the concrete foundation of the laundry visible next to it. There's one other foundation that remains. That, I'm sad to say, was actually the morgue. There were about 180 people who did die during the time that the Heart Mountain Camp was opened, and that morgue was the place that they were brought. Incidentally, about the chimney, we actually had to fix it in 2013. You see, Brickwork needs maintenance, and after about 70 years of not a lot of that, the chimney had leaned about 18 inches to the side. Now, for something this tall, 18 inches doesn't sound like all that much, but then you have to consider that this is 182 tons of bricks, and we really did not want to see that coming down. So the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation did a fundraiser and was able to come in and fix up the chimney a bit, so it should stand for a while longer. As I said earlier, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation is working on acquiring the hospital grounds. There are a lot of stories that can be told here. There were all sorts of rivalries between the doctors working here. There were several strikes over working conditions and questions of status and respect. On the other side of the road from the hospital is the honor roll.
This was originally built by the people of the camp to honor everyone who left the camp to serve with the military. More than 900 men and women left Hart Mountain to serve. But Hart Mountain is also known for the Fair Play Committee, which was the only organized draft resistance movement in these camps. It challenged the constitutionality of drafting people out of such camps. This stance was highly controversial at the time, and the division in the community remains painful to this day. Thank you for joining me. My name is Callie Stusi. I'm the museum manager at the Hart Mountain Interpretive Center. Welcome to the Hart Mountain Honor Roll. The draft was instituted at Hart Mountain in January of 1944. In July of 1944, the camp newspaper, the Hart Mountain Sentinel, announced that the USO was sponsoring a roll call board that would be located in front of the administration building. The roll call board would have about 450 names on it. 385 of those names were of Japanese Americans. The remaining names were from various people who were originally within the administration of the camp who had also been called by the draft to serve in the army. The honor roll was originally intended to be landscaped. The original plans had shrubberies on either side of it, and they had plans for flowers and perhaps a walking area. However, after the camp closed, the honor roll wasn't really maintained for a long time. Eventually, in 1977, the Homesteaders Association, largely led by Mary Blackburn, decided that they were going to clean up the honor roll area. So they cleaned up some of the graffiti that had accumulated and also added a few decorative materials, particularly the stones that you see surrounding the memorial. However, even that renovation had some limits to it. And by the 1990s, there was a bit of a problem with the honor roll. You see, after about 50 years out in the open, the white surface over the wood that you see here had become very broken. And even the parts that remained, the names had faded off of them. So the honor roll was basically illegible by that point. So in 1996, when the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation was founded, one of the very first things that they set out to do was to restore the honor roll. First of all, they took down that original roll call panel and put it away into storage so that it wouldn't degrade any further in the weather. After that, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation did its best to recreate as precisely as possible the original roll call. So the honor roll you see here really does look almost exactly the way it originally did, except that there was one small problem. No one had ever made a complete list of all of the names that were on the honor roll. The Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation did its best. Its board members went through the old newspaper announcements that would often list the names of young men who were setting out to serve in the army. And they also went back, they looked through veterans records, they used their social networks, they did their best to recreate that list. But to this day, we still know that there are a couple of names missing from this list. And that's part of why on this restored honor roll, this panel here is almost completely blank. We are still looking for those mi last missing names. And in fact, if you've ever visited our website, in the section of our website dedicated to the honor roll, we include a list of the names, and we also include a list of reasons why we might not have been able to retrieve the names. Perhaps somebody had already left Heart Mountain before they got their draft notice, for example. 
So we're hoping that we will eventually be able to restore all of the names onto this honor roll. In addition to the honor roll itself, this area has become a bit of a memorial space. Over the years, after the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation was established and began its work on putting, cleaning up this honor roll and also started the initial plans for the interpretive center, over the years, this space started accumulating various memorial markers to Senator Daniel K. Unoue, which was raised after his death in 2012. In addition, we have one dedicated to Congressman Norman Mineta. And in 2006, when the National Park Service recognized this as a national historic site, they raised a plaque and put it here at the honor roll. When the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center opened, we also put in an interpretive trail on the other side of the memorial. That is the Setsuko Saito Higuchi Trail, and it circles around the space behind the memorial where the administrative center used to be. In addition, this area behind me was an area for where the administrators lived. There were some barracks that were set aside as housing for them. And as a final touch of scale, if you have ever seen those iconic pictures of Heart Mountain with the mountain in the background and the rows and rows of barracks in front of it, this field behind me is where those pictures were taken. That is where the residential area of the camp was. Almost no trace remains of the residential area of the camp today. After the camp closed, the land was divided into parcels and awarded by lottery to homesteaders. Homesteaders had the option of buying buildings from the camp for as little as $1 for half a barrack building. Moving the buildings onto their land was their responsibility, but once done, it counted as building a house on the land, therefore improving it, and thus fulfilling the homesteading requirements. As a result, very few traces of the camp remain on the physical site, but many of the old barracks can be seen throughout the Bighorn Basin, if one looks carefully. Sometimes, however, these parcels of land included other features. The Jolovich family received the land that included the two large root cellars built by the Japanese Americans, one of which remains mostly intact to this day. They donated it to the foundation in 2015, and the foundation is currently in the process of restoring the surviving cellar. The Heart Mountain Root Cellar was constructed in 1943 by the camp's engineering department. Actually, there were two of these originally, and if you look around and just take in the scope back behind you over here and then on back behind me, you can see that this is a massive structure. In fact, this is over 300 feet long down here, and it was one of two. So this space that we're in is roughly half of what the engineering department estimated they would need to hold vegetables enough to feed the entire camp for one year. And so they began this in the summer of 1943. All they had really on the project was a single excavator and hand tools in order to get this done. And actually, if you look up close at the timbers right here, you can see some of these are very rough sawn. They look like they were just harvested from the forest. And that's because, in fact, they were. The uh, camp actually set up a sawmill or took over a sawmill in the Shoshone National Forest and sent a Japanese American crew out there to start harvesting timbers for this root cellar and hauling them back here to the camp. And so uh, from the very start, even from cutting down the trees, this was built entirely through uh, Japanese American incarcerated labor. 
And it's the only structure that still survives today at the camp that was designed and built by the Japanese Americans while they were here. Just one among the many reasons why it is a very special structure to us. So let's talk a little bit about the work that we've done already. If you look back here, you will see that we've got some electric lighting going in right here. And in fact, if we move a little closer, you'll see that this represents most of the work that we've done so far. In 2018, we came in with sort of an exploratory phase of cellar restoration to try and understand just what restoring this place would take. And so we began a very complicated process of taking off part of the roof right here, uh, putting new boards on it, also repairing any damaged roof beams and joists that we had up there. But the hardest part was actually to start jacking this up again. If you look up right up here, you can see how the weight of the earthen roof on the cellar has actually started to collapse and compress it over time. And so when we come back in here, we have to very slowly jack this up inch by inch. And then at the same time, we have to also pull in the sides so that they don't separate outward anymore and bring this back into plumb. So for each of these bays that we have right here, this is a very complicated process that can take several hours in order just to get it right back up into place there. So now we're standing in what is probably one of the most deteriorated parts of the cellar here, right in sort of the center of the structure right here. And you can see up behind me how this has got the most compression and the most collapse right here. So we actually received a grant from the National Park Service to continue our work uh, beyond what we've done already. And part of that will be to install some bracing down in here that will stabilize this and keep it from collapsing any further or from dragging down any of the rest of the cellar with it. Beyond that, thanks to a grant from the Eritani Foundation in 2021, we'll actually continue the work that we started down at the other end of the cellar, bringing that forward and bringing all of these bays back up into place once again and restoring the entrance as well so that we can start to bring the public down here. Now back behind me, you'll see what is one of the uh, most strange uh, features of the cellar right here. If you look closely back there, you'll actually see an old abandoned car. So this is, I believe, a 58 or 59 Chevy that we've got sitting back here behind me. Uh, this was put down here after the camp was closed, of course. The cellar uh, was purchased by the Jolovich family eventually. And they actually kept running a potato operation in here for several years, but after they had abandoned that, uh, a son-in-law of the family uh, was working on this car. Uh, the uh, patriarch of the family was tired of seeing it sitting in the driveway, not running. And so it was eventually moved out here down to the cellar where it's been here ever since. Uh, but uh, this gives you a little snapshot of what the cellar is all about and what we're working to try and restore this uh, really important structure. So thank you for joining us for this brief exploration of the Heart Mountain site. We are very sad that our annual July pilgrimage was canceled this year, but it has been an honor to participate in this virtual pilgrimage. And perhaps you will have a chance to visit us sometime here in the shadow of Heart Mountain.